The views and opinions expressed on any programme are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the programme and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of FRC Media, Bristol Community College or the City of Fall River. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Samuel Casso. Dr. Casso is the Charles Northam Professor of History at Trinity College, which is in uh, Connecticut. Um, he's the author of um, numerous articles. I'd be here half the day just mentioning the articles that he's written, both dealing with Russia, Eastern European Jews, some other subjects. Um, he's also uh, has written at least four books that I could see. One of the books that he'll be talking about today is uh, Who Will Write Our History? Emmanuel Ringelbaum and the Onyx Shabbat Archive, which you'll hear a lot about. Um, it's, this book has won a number of awards and um, also the subject of a documentary produced by uh, Roberta Grossman and Nancy Spielberg in 2019. Many of you may have seen it. Well, that was based on the book. So with all of that, uh, Dr. Casso. Thanks. Well, thanks for uh, inviting me. It's a, a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, and I'm here to talk about uh, one of the most uh, inspiring and successful examples of what's called cultural resistance or spiritual resistance in Nazi-occupied Europe. That is the underground archive in the Warsaw Ghetto which was organized by the historian Emanuel Ringelblum. On uh, March 1st, 1944, just uh, a week before he was caught by the Germans and murdered, uh, Emanuel Ringelblum wrote one of his last letters. And he wrote it to a good friend of his who, like himself, was hiding on the Aryan side of German-occupied Warsaw. And in this letter, Ringelblum asked his friend, if you're caught and I'm caught, if none of us survive the war, what will happen to the OS? The OS was code for Oinik Shabbos, Oinik Shabbat in Hebrew, Joy of the Sabbath, which was the uh, code name of the secret archive. And uh, Ringelblum had very good reason to worry because by 1945, when the war was over, of the 60 or so people that he had brought into the archive to work with him, there were only three survivors. That is Hirschwasser, his wife, of Bluma Wasser and the journalist Rachel Auerbach, uh, who would go on to Yad Vashem in Israel, where she started the Testimonies Division and played a major behind the scenes role in the Eichmann trial. And I've translated her memoirs for the National Yiddish Book Center, and they'll be published in a couple of months. So there were only three survivors. And of the three survivors, only one, Hirschwasser, knew where the archive had been buried. That is, under what had been a Jewish school in the Warsaw Ghetto on Novolipki 68. And Wasser survived by a very slim margin, once actually jumping from a train that was taking him to Treblinka. Now, Auerbach and Wasser buttonholed people, they cajoled people. We have to start looking for this buried treasure. And uh, we buried it under the ruins of Novolipki 68. We, ha we have to start a search. But if anyone has seen what Warsaw looked like in 1945 and 1946, it looked like this. That is, after the uh, German bombing during the invasion of Poland in September 1939, 
after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of April 1943, after the Polish Uprising of August and September 1944, where 200,000 Poles died, and after which the Germans then systematically dynamited the rest of the city, Warsaw was literally a heap of rubble. And it was hard to know where a street had been, much less where a particular building had been. But with some help from the Joint Distribution Committee and with some help from the Jewish Labor Committee, uh, Jewish authorities in post-war Poland hired a team of engineers and surveyors, and using the spire of a church that was somehow still standing, and using pre-war aerial photographs, they kind of guessed where this street might have been, where this building might have been, and they started to dig. And on September 18, 1946, uh, a shovel hit the first of 10 tin boxes. And you're seeing one of them here. This was the first cache of the archive that had been buried in August 1942. Uh, a lot of water had seeped in to, to those boxes in the course of four years. A lot of documents were lost, especially documents that were written in ink. A lot of photographs were lost. Only 70 survived. And Vosser said, you know, we have to keep on looking because we buried a lot more. But they kept on looking, but nothing else came up. Now, I just want to add, you see here Schwasser, whose back is towards you. The guy in the mustache was Michal Borovich, who later became a historian in Paris. And he also survived by a thin margin. In 1943, he was actually hanged in the Anovska labor camp in Lvov. But the rope broke. And the SS commander, being a gentleman and most of the SS commanders, you know, were well-educated, degrees from Marburg, Göttingen, and so on. The SS commander didn't believe in hanging people twice. So Borovich was sent back to his hut in the camp, and then he escaped. But anyway, they kept looking. Nothing else came up. Well, as you know, in the course of 1947-48, Poland becomes a communist, Stalinist dictatorship. Auerbach, Wasser, and his wife leave Poland for Israel. And then four years later, in December 1950, as Polish construction workers are building new apartment buildings on the ruins of the former ghetto, they discover two aluminum milk cans. Here's Wasser and, and Rachel Auerbach. And here are the aluminum milk cans, which were discovered in December 1950. Those are some of the tin boxes. Uh, the uh, construction workers looked at these aluminum milk cans and their eyes lit up because all over Poland and Ukraine and Belarus after the war, uh, the local non-Jewish population would go to the sites where Jews had been murdered. They also went to Treblinka and Belzec's with a lot of shovels. It was a Yukon gold rush because everybody knew that every Jew was loaded with money. And the idea was that on these Jewish corpses there might be gold. So there was a lot of digging. Jan Gross of Princeton wrote a book about this. Uh, in fact, when when I first went to the site of the mass grave where most of my family was murdered in 1942, the Jewish survivors had covered it with a cement slab because everybody from the town had been digging for money. So anyway, the Polish workers thought that the uh, aluminum milk cans were full of diamonds and dollars. And, and imagine their disappointment when it turns out that these aluminum milk cans were stuffed with papers. 
and they were going to junk them. But just then, the foreman came back from his lunch break, and he said, you can't junk this. This is important. And he had it turned over to the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. And because of that, we have Emanuel Ringelblum's diary. We have the writings of the Pesechner Rebbe, uh, and we have a lot more. Now, according to, to Hirschwasser, there was a third cache, which was buried uh, a week before the outbreak of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in April 1943. This was buried under the site of the brushmaker shop in, on the Schwendeerska Street. During the uprising, this was the scene of very heavy fighting. Uh, over time, after the war, this became the site of the Chinese embassy in Warsaw. Uh, about 20 years ago, Israeli researchers got permission from the Chinese to dig underneath their embassy, but they kind of came up empty. Uh, not so long ago, Richard F Freund, who had been at the University of Hartford, uh, applied for permission to come back to that embassy site with high-tech equipment. Uh, but one, the Chinese said no, and two, Richard unfortunately passed away. So, but I don't think there's anything left. I think probably people found whatever had been buried after the war, seeing they were papers, they were simply junked. So as you can see, quite a lot has been lost, but nevertheless, nevertheless, we still have about 35,000 usable documents. Now, I, I've been on the committee that supervised the publication of the entire surviving archive in Poland. The last volume was finished last year, and it comes to 36 fat volumes, 36 volumes. And now there's a limited project to publish selected documents in English, and that's slated to run to 10 volumes, and seven volumes have already been published. So there's a lot. Now, an obvious question is, who cares? Why does this matter? Why is this important? Well, it goes to the title that I chose for my book, Who Will Write Our History? Now, the Germans thought that they would win the war. Uh, and after destroying this accursed Jewish race, they would then decide how and if the Jews would be remembered at all. One of Emanuel Ringelblum's teachers, the historian Isaac Shipper, said to a fellow inmate at Maidanic just before Shipper was murdered, what we know about murdered peoples is usually what their killers choose to say about them. And that's true. If you look at history, if you look at the many peoples who've been totally wiped out uh, either by uh, planned genocide or by disease, you know, many tribes in the Americas and, and uh, so on. What do we know about them? What the people who, who killed them have to write about them? And so Shippers said, what we know about murdered peoples is usually what their killers choose to say about them. And uh, he also said, history is usually written by the victor, and they're going to have the last word. But uh, Emanuel Ringelblum in the Warsaw Ghetto said, no, even if we don't live to see, even if we don't live to see the end of the war, we will leave time capsules. We'll bury them under the ground. We'll stuff them full of Jewish documents. And someday those time capsules will surface, and posterity will remember us on the basis of our documents and not on the basis of German documents. We will not be remembered as simply a mass of helpless, anonymous, nameless victims. We will be remembered as people with names. And uh, he went ahead and he arranged for those time capsules to be filled 
and they were buried, and at least some of them surfaced after the war. And think about this. To write uh, reflected a kind of a necessary optimism, because 80% of Polish Jews were killed in 1942, at a time when the Germans were winning the war. And if you thought the Germans were going to win the war, then why bother to write? But you had to believe that in the end, Hitler would lose. Now think about this. Now I'm a historian, and uh, I've often asked myself, if the Ringelblum archive had never been found, how would historians have been able to write about the history of the Warsaw Ghetto, which contained 500,000 Jews at one point? Uh, you look at all of the amazing books that have been written about the ghetto, Israel Gutmann, Havi Dreyfus, Jacek Liochak, Basha Engelking, the last two I've worked with on the new museum in Warsaw, uh, the six-volume publication of the Jewish underground press in the Warsaw ghetto, the many scholars who are now uh, writing about the theology of Rabbi Kalana Shapiro, the Pesechner Rebbe, none of this would have been known. Historians would only have been able to write about the history of the perpetrators, or they would have had to rely on survivor memoirs. But survivors, as we're going to see, had a very different point of view than people who were writing in real time. So none of this would have been possible. In short, Jews fought not just with guns. Very few Jews had access to guns. But Jews fought, and they fought effectively, with paper and pen. The great uh, dean of Jewish history in Eastern Europe, Shimon Dubnov, was being led to his execution at the age of 81. Before he was shot, he yelled in Yiddish, Yidin Fashreit. Jews write everything down. In 1946, under the ruins of crematorium number three in Auschwitz-Birkenau, people found glass bottles stuffed with the writings of Zalman Grudowski, who was a member of the Auschwitz Underkommando, people who had to empty the bodies from the gas chambers and burn them. And uh, he was killed in October 1944. But he left glass bottles, and more glass bottles were found in 1964. And those writings have just been published in English. In the Vilna Ghetto, there was the diary of Hermann Crook, a librarian, uh, who wrote every day. His last entry was four hours before he was murdered. Uh, Yale University Press published that in translation some years ago. It comes to over 600 pages. In Krakow, in the Montepelch prison, a young Jewish woman, Justinia Dranger, while she was waiting to be executed, she wrote a long journal on toilet paper. And she was shot but an inmate took the toilet paper and saved it, and University of Massachusetts Press published that in its entirety. There were also underground archives in uh, Lodz, in, in Bialystok, in Vilna. But the Oynik Shabbos archive in the Warsaw Ghetto was uh, the biggest such project, and it was really the biggest in all of Nazi-occupied Europe. Uh, it was different in many ways. First of all, as I said, it was a real collective. Sixty people of all persuasions. Rabbis like Shimon Huberbond, who was Ringelblum's link to the religious community. Communists like Yehuda Fell. Uh, Zionists like Lipa Bloch. Bundists like Shia Rabinovich. The famous, the not so famous, young and old men and women putting to the side their political differences in order to fulfill a national mission. The archive was very well organized. There was a committee, uh, an executive committee, that met every Saturday afternoon. They would raise money. They would 
uh, decide who to recruit. They would decide what subjects needed to be written about. And there were two secretaries, Vassar and Eliyahu Gutkovsky, and they were the links between Ringelblum and the 60 co-workers in the ghetto. They handed out paper and ink, they collected assignments, uh, they distributed money. There was also a very important core of interviewers. Now, imagine, you know, the Oynik Shabbos wanted to get as much information as it could from all over Poland, which meant that they had to find out what was going on in many different cities. And they eventually collected more than 400 essays on cities and regions all over Poland. How did they do this? Well, the Germans dumped 100,000 refugees into the Warsaw Ghetto. Now, these were very unlucky people. They got the short straw because you could have been living in a small town and you would have had a house and you would have been able to hide money and valuables and you were still hoping you'd survive the war. But one day the Germans said, everybody out, everybody is leaving this town, it's going to be Judenrein, free of Jews, we're dumping you into the Warsaw Ghetto. And if on Monday you were the father of a family and you had hopes for survival, on Tuesday you were dumped penniless into a refugee center in the Warsaw Ghetto where 1,000, 2,000 people lived in a former school, in a former synagogue, uh, without resources, dependent on a bowl of soup and a slice of bread a day, no sanitary conditions, and very quickly they were covered with lice, and they, of course, became carriers of the terrible pandemic in the Warsaw Ghetto, which was typhus. Now, the interviewers had to go into those refugee centers to interview people. You're from what town? Tell us everything that happened from the beginning of the war to now. Tell us about your experiences. And Ringelblum wanted uh, different points of view, uh, ideally from the same town, a religious person, a non-religious person, a young person, an old person. And these interviewers were going into feeded, overcrowded rooms full of people with typhus. And uh, typhus was about 50% fatal. And many of the interviewers died, but they did it. Uh, imagine if you were asked in the early days of the COVID pandemic, before there was a vaccine, to go into a room full of coughing people to get information. How many of you would say, I'll do it? There was also a uh, technical staff composed of a teacher, Israel Lichtenstein, and two of his teenage students. This technical staff, they had the uh, actual physical control of the documents. As the documents came in, they were handed over to them and they hid it inside the school building. Uh, and that, of course, meant that of the 60 or so people who were in the archive, only six knew where the documents were buried at any one time, which lowered the risks that the Gestapo would find where the archive was under torture and destroy it. Now, it's important to remind you that the reason the archive worked so well was that it was very well camouflaged. That is, it was folded into a big organization called the Alenhil for the self-help. Now remember, half a million people in the Warsaw Ghetto. It's a lot. And the self-help organized schools, daycare centers, a whole network of soup kitchens, refugee centers. It was a losing battle, but they fought against hunger and they did what they could. And because they were getting certain sums of money from an American organization called the Joint Distribution Committee, and because until Pearl Harbor, Germany and America were not at war, the Germans 
kind of allowed the Elaine Hills to function. And that meant that all of the salaries, the paper, the ink, the employees could all be folded into the Elaine Hills. Not only that, but the interviews for information could be disguised as interviews for a ticket to a soup kitchen. Uh, uh, essays that were asked of refugees or students in the schools in the ghetto could be seen as essays in an effort to improve the quality of schools or the quality of uh, refugee relief and so on. So this was another way that the archive could function on a very efficient level. The Onik Shabbos archive had a very ambitious agenda. The first agenda item, which begins in November 1940 when Ringo first organized the archive, was to collect stuff. Collect stuff. What kind of stuff? For example, in the Warsaw Ghetto, there were uh, some Jews who had tons of money. 90% of the calories consumed in the Warsaw Ghetto were smuggled in. The official German ration, the official German ration was 184 calories a day. Okay, the, the, uh, the Elaine Hilf was able to buy extra provisions. If you were eating in the soup kitchens, you would have about 800 calories a day. But you can't live on 800 calories longer than four months. Try it. It's very difficult. So the smugglers saved the ghetto. And of course, because smuggling, by definition, required collaboration with poles on the other side of the wall, and the people who had the best skills for that had been the the gang members from before the war, burglars, criminals, and so on, the smugglers on the one hand were doing a, a great deed. On the other hand, of course, they were making tons of money. And in the ghetto, you're not going to you know, sign up for savings bonds. You're not going to deposit money in a, in a certificate of deposit. You simply had cash. So not only that, there were police who were getting bribes, there were Gestapo informants, there were people who started underground factories and were making a lot of money by smuggling out consumer goods to the poles on the Aryan side. So there was, a, there was a network of legal licensed fancy restaurants where you could get a gourmet meal for a thousand zwotis. If you worked all day in a regular job in the ghetto, you got seven zwotis. So one meal would cost a thousand but roast goose, cognac, wine, whatever. The archive wanted the menus of those restaurants. The archive wanted the uh, entertainment uh, 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 programs of those restaurants. If you've ever seen The Pianist, you saw that The Pianist was playing in one of those fancy restaurants, Vladislav Spielmann. They wanted uh, doorbell instructions if five, six families are living in a single apartment, even more, ring the bell twice for this family, three times for that family, it would show people in the future how crowded the ghetto was, and so on and so forth. In 1941, the archive got together and decided that they were going to embark on an ambitious academic, sociological, interdisciplinary study of Jewish society under the Nazi occupation. And it was slated to run to 1,600 pages with 80 different topics. Women, children, religious life, corruption, Jewish-Polish relations, Jewish-German relations, so on. Each team leader would draw up the bullet points for the for his or her topic, uh, based on questionnaires, questions to be asked. And some members of the archive were team leaders of four or five different topics. Now, at this point, you know, I, I just want to make a, a few observations. Number one, in 1941, when they decided to do this, they didn't know that the next year the Germans were going to kill everybody. 
This was before the final solution had begun, and the Germans themselves didn't decide they were going to kill all the Jews until sometime later that, that year. So the purpose of this was, we'll survive the war, and then after the war, the Polish Jews will look at what we found, and they'll ask themselves, where did we, where did we screw up? Where did we succeed? What lessons can we draw as a community from the wartime experience? Now, it's important to also remember that Emanuel Ringelblum and almost all the members of the executive committee had been active in a pre-war institution called the YIVO, Y-I-V-O, which was founded in Vilna in 1925 and which still exists in New York. And uh, the YIVO uh, dedicated itself to bringing together scholars on the one hand and ordinary Jews on the other and getting uh, uh, the common people involved in the study of Jewish life in Eastern Europe from, from the point of view of many disciplines, anthropology, philology, sociology, uh, photography, the YIVO encouraged amateur history. The YIVO encouraged engaged tourism. The, uh, the uh, YIVO encouraged Jews to start museums. In, in other words, to develop self-respect, that we live, we've lived in Eastern Europe for a thousand years. We're not strangers. And uh, by connecting to our lives and by connecting to our language, the Yiddish language, we will somehow develop the psychological wherewithal to deal with growing Polish anti-Semitism. Now, it's interesting, this idea that knowledge is a weapon. And there was a pun, Wissenschaft. Now, the Yiddish word, the Yiddish uh, words for YIVO are Yiddischer Wissenschaftliche Institut the Jewish scientific organization. Wissenschaft means science in Yiddish, but if you break it into two words, Wissenschaft, knowledge creates. Knowledge is a weapon, Wissenschaft. In 1932, the director of the YIVO, Max Weinreich, got a Rockefeller fellowship to go to Yale. And Weinreich made a beeline to the African-American colleges in the Jim Crow South. Why? Because he believed that the YIVO could learn a lot from African-American educators. The problem as, that he saw was that there was an entire generation of Jewish young people in Poland. There were close to four million Jews in Poland. And Jewish young people were being told by the Poles, you're less. You're simply less. You're pariahs. We don't want you as friends. We don't want you in our homes. We're not going to give you jobs. If you left, we'd be very happy. And the problem was that Weinreich believed that the solutions that many Polish Jewish kids were grasping for, communism, the Soviet paradise on the one hand, or Zionism on the other, Weinrach believed that neither solution was really realistic, given reality. So he wanted to find out how, uh, in African American colleges, they are getting their students to deal with the reality of living in a society where they're pariahs, where they're second class citizens. And he came back with those insights, and he began a whole new department of the Evo called Jungfor, or the study of young people. And uh, the war interrupted this, but he was trying to, by using questionnaires and interviews, he was trying to figure out how to create uh, a way of getting Jewish young people to uh, somehow uh, overcome the psychological and other barriers that they were facing. And this emphasis on interviews and on questionnaires, this 
was very important in the approach of the Onik Shabbos archive. Uh, now, all of this was in full swing when, on July 22, 1942, the SS barges into the office of Adam Chernyakov, the head of the Warsaw Jewish Council, and says, beginning today, the Jewish police are going to provide 7,000 Jews a day for evacuation to the east, where they will be put to work. And beginning that day, the Jewish police collected 7,000 people day after day after day. Each Jewish policeman was told, if you don't collect five, six, seven Jews and report each head to your SS handler, we'll deport you and your family. So many Jewish policemen turned into bloodhounds. Now, Chernyakov himself committed suicide a day later, but it didn't have any impact on the deportations. And between July 22, 1942, and September 12, 1942, when a pause began, 300,000 Jews were deported to the gas chambers. Now, what happened to the archive during that summer? If you look at the archive, it was decimated. The 60 became 50, became 40, became 30. Every day, another important person was taken away with his family, with her family. Ringelblum, you could sense by the way he was writing or not writing, was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. He was torn between his natural fear and his natural belief uh, as a father and a husband to hide, to try to save his family, and his feeling of responsibility to the archive to keep working. But he kept on. And other people kept on, too. Abraham Lewin, who was a very important worker and whose diary was published uh, years ago by Oxford University Press, again found in the milk cans. He came home in August to find that his wife had been taken away. That day, he changed the language of his diary from Yiddish to Hebrew. It became no, it was no longer a personal document in Yiddish. It became a communal, covenantal document in Hebrew, like the medieval chronicles, but they kept on working. So one question that you might want to ask yourself is that as their world was collapsing all around them, as they knew that they might die tomorrow or the next day, why did they bother to keep on going? And I think a partial answer to that question might be found in an unfinished essay written by another member of the archive, Gustavo Yaretska. Gustavo Yaretska was a uh, young woman, mother of two children, uh, very, a member of the Polish Socialist Party before the war, very assimilated, she wrote in Polish, she was a stenographer on the Judenrat, and she had a Judenrat pass. So during the roundups, Ringelblum thought that pass would save her from arrest, and he asked her to walk through the streets as the roundups were going on and write down everything she saw. And she managed to begin an amazing essay before she and her two children were taken to Treblinka. And in this essay, which was found in the milk cans, among other things that Yaretska said, how could you have blamed us Jews? And I think she could also have said, how could you blame us socialists for having believed that the story of mankind, the story of human history, is a story of moral improvement. It's a story of progress from savagery to barbarism to decency. That's where the wheel of history seemed to be going. But now I see that the most educated, cultured nation in Europe, the Germans, are murdering kids in the streets. And they don't even bat an eye. And it looks as if we were totally wrong. In fact, the wheel of history is moving in the opposite direction, from decency and culture towards savagery. And if that's the case, and now I'm quoting her directly, if that's the case, then I hope that my writings will serve, and now I'm quoting her, as a stone under history's wheel. That is that someday, people will read what I'm writing today in the Warsaw Ghetto, and they'll say, oh my God, how could this have happened? 
How could we have allowed this to happen? Let's make sure that this never happens again. During the course of 1942, for March, and then again in August, escapees from the Nazi death camps filtered into the Warsaw Ghetto. One escapee from the Chelno death camp, the first uh, gassing uh, extermination camp that the Nazis established in December 1941, and then in August 42, five or six escapees from Treblinka. And uh, the Onik Shabbos took them all in hand, and they interviewed them in great detail. The first interview was with the escapee from Chelno, who described how Jews from western Poland and the Ludge ghetto were herded into gas vans, and how he had to empty the gas vans. And then the escapee from Treblinka. One interview with Avram Kshapitsky, the interview was conducted by Rachel Auerbach, ran to more than a hundred typed pages in Yiddish. This interview was so detailed that while Treblinka was murdering 15 to 20,000 people a day, while the camp was working at full steam, as, as we say, Kshapitsky was drawing a map of what the camp looked like. He described what the gas chambers looked like, orange tiles. He described the routine. He described the German guards, the Ukrainian guards. He, he didn't survive. He died in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. But on the basis of these reports, and on the basis of reports from, from other survivors, uh, during the course of 1942, using the channels of the Polish underground, the Onyx Shabbos sent four detailed reports to the Polish government in exile in London. The last report, sent in November 1942, included a map of Treblinka, again, while Treblinka was still working. And the, Poles, the Polish underground government passed all these reports to the British and to the Americans. Ringelblum's motto was, write everything down now. Don't wait. And don't decide, I'm not going to write about this because it's not important. It's not up to you to decide what's important. Let historians decide that. And don't say, well, I'll write tomorrow, because tomorrow you might be dead. Or tomorrow you might see things today that'll turn you into a different person. I want immediate writing. Ringel Bloom <coughs> instinctively understood the difference between contemporaneous testimony and survivor memory. The Jews that were giving evidence to the Onik Shabbos archive were still a part of a living community. The ghetto was not a concentration camp. It still had social space. It was, these people were still affected by pre-war norms. Their fears and hopes, their fight for survival gave, gave historians a very different kind of material than what survivors were able to give 20 or 30 years later. One example would be the case of Cecilia Slapakova, who was a, uh, a highly educated woman who did a lot of translation. And she was in charge of the study of Jewish women for this uh, uh, study project. And uh, she interviewed all kinds of women, PhDs, librarians, all the way to prostitutes and smugglers. And she wrote, she started to write an essay in May 42. Again, she was killed in Treblinka with her daughter. But she said in this essay, what I've discovered is that in wartime, women have shown much greater psychological strength than men. Men have been more likely to become depressed, passive, and the uh, burden of keeping the ghetto going has fallen more and more on the shoulders of women. Women have shown incredible courage and strength. And I believe that when the war is over, the woman, the Jewish woman in Poland will not let herself be pushed back into the kitchen. She will demand an equal place at the table. Well, she was killed. 
But let's assume that she survived and she goes to a DP camp in Germany after the war. By the way, I was born in one of those camps. She remarries. She settles in the Boston suburbs. She gives an interview to Spielberg or her grandchildren say, Bubby, you know, you should write your memoirs. Would she even have remembered that in 1942 she was waxing lyrical about the great prospects for Jewish women in Poland after the war? The ghetto would have shrunk in her memory to a mere holding pen for the camps. She would have remembered the camps. She would have remembered how she survived. She knew what happened, and therefore the evidence that she was giving historians would have been very, very different. And Ringel Bloom understood this. But thanks to the Yonik Shabbos, we hear the different voices of Polish Jewry at the very end. Children's essays in June 1942. What do I want to be when the war is over? The sermons of the Piasechner Rebbe. How can God allow this to happen? A meeting of a house committee where a chairwoman, Mrs. Kaplan, is asking Mrs. Levin and Mrs. Cohn to find kids in the building who are not getting enough to eat. Of course, very few kids got enough to eat and see if they could match them with families who might give them an extra four or five meals a week. An ordinary ghetto mailman, Peretzopachinsky, who describes how at the height of the deportations, on a very hot day, Jewish toddlers were sitting on a bench in the hot sun, crying for their parents who'd been taken away. And any Jew who went up to that bench to give these kids food or water was beaten by the SS. And Opachinsky said the Germans didn't have to have those kids on the bench. They could have taken them away, but they left them there just so we Jews could suffer a little bit more, just so we Jews could suffer a little bit more. Now, there was another document from the milk cans. The person who wrote this document was a Yiddish writer named Shia Perla, who died in Auschwitz in 1943. Perla wrote something that I'm sure he never would have written had he survived. He had just seen a Jewish policeman, this was on August 25th, 1942, he just seen a Jewish policeman pulling a five-year-old Jewish kid and saying to the SS man, here's my fifth head of the day, hoping the SS man would check him off, okay, you've done your work for the day, you can go home. Instead, the SS man pulled out a pistol, shot the little kid, and as the little kid was dying on the pavement, the SS man said, this little dog doesn't count as a head. Go find me an adult. And the Jewish policeman scampers off to find an adult Jew. And Perla says, how could a people produce such garbage as the Jewish police? Perhaps this is what he said then, which I'm sure he never would have said had he survived. Perhaps a people that can produce such scum is a people that deserves everything it's getting. Now, after the war, of course, it's the six million. The, they're all martyrs. You don't speak ill of the dead. But this underscores a very important difference between real-time contemporaneous writing in the ghettos and in the camps and post-war writing. In the war, the th Jewish anger against other Jews was a very major theme because Jews didn't see Germans that much. They did see other Jews who were handing them over. And of course, you have to understand the, what, what, how people were reacting to this disaster. You, you will look at writers like Avram Levin, the poet Yitzhak Katz, Katz Nelson, and others. Polish Jewry had been the cultural core of Ashkenazi Jewry. It was being destroyed. They didn't think American Jewry or Soviet Jewry would be able to take its place. A Jewish state was a far, was a far cry away. Britain was not going to allow it. They didn't have the comfort of knowing 
that there would be a Jewish state after the war. They saw the end of the Jewish people, and they were dying in, in an era of black depression, and they were full of anger. And it's in this context of anger that you had writings like this. Now, this was found in the milk can, and Ringelblum could very easily have said, you know what, this doesn't make us look good. I'm going to tear this up. But he didn't, because as a historian, he wanted future historians to trust him. He, he, he did not believe in alternative facts. That was for the future. But in 1942, there was such a thing as facts. And Ringelblum believed that if you give historians all kinds of different sources, they will sort it out. And he believed that ultimately, the documents will tell the following story. Yes, there was a thin layer of morally compromised people, but the average Jew acted okay. What he called in Yiddish, the stille Heldentum von the Miedischen Massenmensch, the quiet heroism of the ordinary Jew, Jews who had no money, who had no chance in hell of surviving, but who did their best to maintain their dignity, who tried to help their neighbors, and who died without a chance to survive. Now, okay, Emanuel Ringelblum, who was born in 1900 in the town of Buchach, he was a cousin of the great Israeli writer Shai Agnon, who got the Nobel Prize for Literature. They, they were cousins, they came from the same town. Sigmund Freud's grandfather came from that town. Uh, in 1939, when the war broke out, he was in Switzerland at a Zionist Congress. He could have saved himself, but he went back to Warsaw, even as Warsaw was being bombed by the Germans, not just because his family was there, but because he believed that somebody has to come back and deal with refugee relief. Somebody has to leave. Most of the Jewish leadership of Warsaw ran away. And Ringelblum came back. Now, war tests people. Sometimes the great, or people who are thought to be great, are found out to be hollow. And people who are not regarded as first rank rise to greatness. And Ringelblum was in that second category. And before the war, he wore th th three hats. The first hat was politics. He was very much engaged and radical Marxist politics. Uh, he was a member of a left-wing Zionist group called the Linke Polizion, the, the, the left labor Zionists. Those kinds of parties had no chance of ever having power, but it was like a family. That's where you met your friends, your spouse. That's where you got your ideals. The ideology of the party was very, very complicated. I mean, a Yiddish-speaking, binational Soviet Palestine. Not easy to explain. He was into that. But for our purposes, it gave him idealism, it gave him a meaning in life, and it gave him a great love of the Yiddish language and Yiddish culture. This was one of the very few Zionist organizations that was devoted mainly to Yiddish because Yiddish was the language of the Jewish working class. And it was in the party that he met his, that he met his wife, Yehudis Cutler. They had one son, Yuri. And Yuri was the apple of Ringelblum's eye. Now, Ringelblum worked at five different gigs to support his family. And one of those gigs was teaching in a private school for wealthy Jewish girls where the language of instruction was Polish. And these girls would kind of make fun of Dr. Ringelblum. Dr. Ringelblum would always be running in a little disheveled, a little sweaty. And uh, when they didn't want to take an exam, one would be delegated to raise her hand. Dr. Ringelblum, yes. Uh, before we start the exam, uh, you haven't said much about Yuri lately. You haven't said much about your son. How's he doing? And Ringelblum would pull out a wallet. He'd show pictures, and uh, he'd start talking, and then the bell would ring, and they would have extra time 
to study for the exam. And here's Ringelblum and his beloved son. Now, the second hat that Ringelblum wore was as a community organizer. Uh, and in the 1930s, he began to work for the Joint Distribution Committee, organizing microcredit in Jewish towns. And microcredit became very, very important. And he believed in the moral importance of self-help. And he took that with him into the Warsaw Ghetto, where he led the Alenium. The third hat he wore was as a historian. He got his history PhD in 1926. Jewish historians in Poland had no chance of getting a job, but they saw themselves as soldiers. They were soldiers against Polish historians who were publishing big fat books showing that the Jews were responsible for Poland's fall in the 18th century. The Jews were these outsiders, these parasites who uh, battened down on the hardworking Poles. Because of the Jews, the Poles never developed a middle class, and they were taken over by the Russians and the Prussians and the Austrians. And Jewish historians like Ringelblum had to publish books not so fat because they didn't have the money to show that Jews had built Poland, had fought for Poland, had been there as long as the Poles, and were there by right and not by sufferance. So Jews were soldiers fighting against the Poles. But Ringelblum, being a left-wing Marxist, also saw himself as a soldier fighting battles against Jews because he rejected this idea that Jewish history is the story of rabbis and wealthy Jews and poor Jews walking hand in hand to the synagogue to pray while their women are at home lighting candles and preparing a nice meal. What Ringelblum wanted to emphasize were the forgotten people in Jewish history, Jewish women, the Jewish poor, Jewish apprentices. He wrote about class struggle in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, he uh, uh, wanted uh, Jewish history to focus less on religion and more on economics, that we know enough about the Sabbath Jew, but we need to know more about the weekday Jew. On the fourth day of the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto, Ringelblum was caught by the Germans, sent to the Trubniki labor camp. He made a daring escape in August, in August 1943. In my book, I talk about that. And he winds up in a hideout with 37 other Jews in the south part of Warsaw. His wife and son are there. And the hideout is being maintained by a Polish family with financial help from the Jewish underground. So there's, there's a greenhouse above the hideout. The Polish family is given the money to start a grocery store, so they'll be able to cover the expenses of getting all that food. There were two people who left the hideout, and they survived, got, got to Israel. She became, Orna Lagur became a, sign, a librarian at the Weizmann Institute, and she wrote a memoir of the hideout. And she said, it was awful. The air was terrible. People were living in fear. It was dark. People always arguing. And there was Ringelblum sitting in a corner by the light of a carbide lamp, writing and writing and writing. Once a week, a courier, von der Rothenberg, who I interviewed, would give him more ink and, and more paper, and he'd give her what he wrote, and he'd go back to writing. He could have escaped that hideout and gone to a better hideout. He could have even gone to Hungary, but he was just obsessed with this final mission. And one of the things he did in those final months was to write his masterpiece, Polish-Jewish Relations in the Second World War. And uh, he, you could feel the tension that he was under. He believed that he was the last Jewish historian left in Poland. And uh, so this Marxist historian begins by comparing himself to a cipher somebody who writes a Torah scroll. He said, if you start to write a Torah scroll, you should go to a mikvah. You should immerse yourself. You should purify yourself. And you should not allow one mistake, because one mistake will render the whole text unclean. And this is how I feel. I feel a crushing responsibility to get the story right. 
800 years of Poles and Jews living side by side now ending in anger and bitterness. And he fought back against the stereotypes, one stereotype that every Pole hated the Jews and was happy to see them killed. He said, this is not true. Poles are risking their life to help me at this moment. He also, of course, fought back against the other stereotype, that Poles were wonderful people who were doing what they could to save Jews. And he said, the story is much more complicated. And basically, he comes up with a very negative judgment of the Polish underground state, the Polish underground army. He's, he realized how difficult it was for Poles to help Jews. If you were caught hiding Jews, the Germans killed you and your family. That was a great deterrent. The, he paid tribute to the Poles' heroism and their courage, their love of country. But he basically said the help the Jews got in Poland was help given by individuals, not because the Polish underground said we have a moral obligation to help our fellow Polish citizens. And he cited an incident that he just heard of that on the streets of Warsaw, the Germans were chasing a Polish resistance fighter who was trying to escape, and all they had to do was yell into the crowd, catch the Jew. And all these Polish passerby helped the Germans catch this fleeing Polish fighter. And his ultimate judgment, as I said, was negative. On March 7, 1944, the hideout was betrayed to the Gestapo. And it was betrayed to a Polish police unit working for the Gestapo and splitting the loot with the Germans. All of the Jews were, and two of the Poles were marched to the Paviak prison. There was a Jewish journalist in the prison, Yechiel Hirschau, who survived the war. And he said that when the prisoners heard that Ringelblum was in the prison, they racked their brains. They tried to figure out how to save him. And Hirschau went in to Ringelblum and said, look, I think, you know, he, he was shocked when he saw Ringelblum. He was badly beaten. And uh, his son was sitting on his lap. He'd been tortured. And he said, look, I think we can get you out of this cell. We can buy off a guard. We can kind of smuggle you into the rest of the prison population. Ringelblum said, I'm not going to leave my wife and kid. And the last words that he remembers Ringelblum saying is he's looking at his son, and he says in Yiddish, why is this little one guilty? Because of this little boy, my heart is really breaking. On March 10th, the next day, all of the Jews and the two Poles were shot. And I want to end this talk by going back to the night of August 3rd, 1942, when Liechtenstein and those two teenagers were burying the first cache of the archive. And they wrote their last wills and testaments in the, and left them on the top of the box that they buried. And none of them survived the war, but the testaments all survived the war. And Liechtenstein writes, I've given my whole life to this archive. I don't ask for praise. I just want to be remembered. I want my wife, Gela Sexting, to be remembered, an artist. She designed sets for the children's theater in the ghetto. I want my little daughter, Marguerite, to be remembered. She's 20 months old, but she equals a four-year-old in intelligence. And if you don't believe me, here are her teachers, and you could ask them. And then he ends by saying, we, the Jews of Eastern Europe, are a redeeming sacrifice for the Jewish people. The Jewish people will survive. And so in the last months of his life, he reminded us that the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto were not anonymous, helpless victims. They fought for their right to be remembered as individuals and as members of a proud and resilient nation. And this is the legacy of the Oynik Shabbos. Thank you. Thank you.